morning, church family. As I look around, I think there are those who have decided to stay home because of the slippery, icy roads. And I think that, in some cases, is actually a good decision. Um, we slid down our driveway this morning and managed to go right between the two posts and the gate. Didn't hit the gate post, so that was a good move. <laughs> All right, well... I want to welcome all of you to the Albany Seventh-day Adventist Church. Those of you who are out in the foyer, we want to encourage you to move into the sanctuary at this time. Just a couple things to uh, anticipate. Next Sabbath, you are going to have opportunity to participate in the worship service. And what we're proposing is that you give some thought to how God has blessed you this past year. And if you would like to plan on maybe sharing a short sentence or two as to how God has blessed you, if there's a Bible text that you have that you'd like to also uh, share with us, we look forward to having you be a part of that worship service next week. So, that's next Sabbath. The other thing that I want to bring to your attention is that at the end of the year is a time when we tend to look at our finances and sort of balance and clean things up. Have I given my offerings? Have I given my tithe, et cetera, et cetera, for the year? And if you find yourself with some extra blessings that God has given you, at the end of the year is a good time to also give to our church here and to participate in the various projects that are taking place. We don't have it as an insert, but I believe last Sabbath we had an insert in here that showed a list of all the projects that have been worked on this past year and how God has blessed there. We do have more projects coming up next year, and if you want to participate in the support of the church in terms of those projects, please keep that in mind as we close out the year. Yes, sir. Okay. Right now? Okay. We're going to have a video presentation at this point in time, and then we'll move into our worship service. There's something really wonderful about the Christmas season. The festivities bring joy, the Christmas music on the radio, the cheerful holiday lights, the warm drinks by the fire on a cold winter night, and the many opportunities for holiday merriment with colleagues, family, and friends. In John 1, we find the most wonderful reason for celebration in this season. The beloved apostle wrote, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Over the centuries, Christians have explored deeply what that means theologically, but sometimes I wonder if we forget what that means practically and relationally. One of the things that I cherish most in this world is being poppy to my two vivacious toddler grandsons. I've enjoyed innovations like FaceTime that have allowed me and my wife to connect with family and click on a button and engage with them. Regularly, my wife or I will have our phone ring because those incredible little boys just want to say, hi, Poppy, hi, Grammy. But nothing compares to connecting in person. Thanksgiving weekend, we got to go together downtown and ride the Portland Christmas train. And it was such a blessing to sit with each of my grandsons on my lap and experience the wonder of Christmas on the train through their eyes. I don't have to tell you, there's nothing like sitting and connecting in person with the ones you love. And that's what Jesus did. The immortal, invisible God wasn't satisfied to connect only through the inspired prophets and their writings. And so he came embodied in flesh and blood, came near and lived with us so he could sit and connect in person with us. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul used Jesus as the example when he said, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, 
being one in spirit and of one mind in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing, being made in human likeness, in human flesh. Jesus became flesh to create a new engagement culture, to show us how humans can live in rich and meaningful, connected community. And every time that we gather around the fire with people that we value and love, we honor his presence. Every time we sit together and pray for one among us who is hurting, we honor his presence. Every time we celebrate together in a season in which the eyes of the world are turned toward the Savior's birth, we honor his presence. The Savior's birth means so much to so many. And yet in this moment in history, we need his example of community more than perhaps ever before. You don't have to look far to see that this world is broken and it's fragmented and it's divided over everything imaginable. Amid brokenness, Jesus is calling us to come together, to experience the oneness of spirit that Paul reminds us of. This is what Christ's likeness really looks like. Today, I want to wish you a blessed Christmas and a joyful new year. This season, may you find the richness of community among further engagement with family and friends and fellow followers of Jesus as we celebrate his incarnation, the word become flesh. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Let us stand for our call to worship. This is taken from Isaiah 45. It reads as follows. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no other besides me. There is no God. I gird you, though you do not know me, that men may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your Son. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come and worship you. Accept us as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath and Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays. Um, I know sometimes we, we come in to church and we get settled. We're grateful to just have made it um, and to have all of our clothes on because we may or may not have forgotten certain things. My son once went to church in Crocs because he didn't change to his Sabbath shoes. Um, so you did make it um, and, and you're completely dressed. Good job. And we sit in the pew and we relax and we just, we just kind of settle in. And sometimes I think we forget we are content and we forget to be happy that we're here. Um, so I invite you to realize that you are here, you made it in one piece, and you are content and that we are very happy to be in the house of the Lord today because obviously not everyone can. Um, so welcome, welcome, happy Sabbath, Merry Christmas, and we're gonna start with number 121, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We will be doing three songs and we'll be doing all the verses of the three songs. And there are a few of us today, so please feel free to sing loudly. Even if you don't think you sing well, sing loud anyway. Number 121, go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their 
watching O'er silent flocks by night Behold throughout the heavens There shone a holy light Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born The shepherds feared and trembled When low above the earth Rang out the angel chorus That hailed the Savior's birth the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And brought us God's salvation That blessed Christmas morn Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain Jesus Christ is born. Our next one is number 136. Good Christians now rejoice. You'll be forgiven if you can't stay quite still in your pew. This one's a fun one. Number 136. Good Christians now rejoice. <laughs> Good Christians now rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. you to stand for our opening song joy to the world and for those of you who are not attending a christmas eve service this may be your last time to sing a christmas hymn with uh, fellow worshipers until next year number 125 joy to the world
resounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns in fast the ground. He comes to seated or standing? Please be seated. Wonders of his love. Can you think of anything over the past year in which you've experienced the wonders of his love? Yes. Every day, yes. It is time for our tithes and offerings. I invite our Deacons to stand at this time. Our offering this week is for the Oregon Youth Support. Youth Support is for things like Big Lake, our academies, scholarships, etc. Many of us in this room have experienced the benefits of those uh, facilities and those uh, institutions that are supported. And this is your opportunity to participate in supporting them. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you have blessed us in so many ways, and we thank you for the opportunity that we can bring a small return to you. Please bless those offerings, bless those who give, and expand those funds, and may they be a blessing to many people out there. Thank you for hearing the prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture this morning is found in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. I'll be reading from the, this New King James? I believe this is New King James, yes. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, a very familiar 
Christmas time verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I invite you to kneel for our prayer this morning as far as you are able. If that gets you all to the way to the floor, great. If not, God will still hear us. Dear Lord, we thank you for another Sabbath day. We thank you especially for another Christmas season when we come together especially to remember the, the gift that you have given us in the advent of Christ your Son. We recognize that we are not worthy, we have never been worthy of the plan for salvation, but we are so thankful that you sent your son to live here among us. We thank you for all the blessings in our lives over the past year, the past month, the past week, since we woke up this morning. Please continue to bless us, each one. Change our hearts, change our minds, so that we can be a blessing to those around us. Please be with our pastor this morning. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. And let your words pour through him unto us. In your name. Amen. The stars are brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul fell. 
thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, all ye the angels' voices of God divine. Oh, night, when Christ was born. The King of Kings lay thus in lowly manger in all our trials, born to be our friend. He knows our need in our weakness. He is no strength. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So good to see so many of you who braved the elements to come on out here today. I was just praying, you know, that the ice and such would just, you know, melt off enough. We'd be able to get to church and worship the Lord today. And I'm so thankful that our family can be here with us. Our son-in-law, our daughter, and uh, Eric's parents, Terry and Melanie. Thank you so much for that beautiful music today. It just inspires me. And we just thank you so much for being here. And, uh, and uh, those of you who are here today, just thank you for being here and for this time that we can remember the Lord and what he's done for us, which is so significant. Amen? So very, very significant in our, in our lives and in our experience. Before we begin, would you just bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer? Our Father and our God today... On this Advent Sabbath, Lord, we want to remember, Lord, the significance of that event. Dear Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts truly would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, for it is in his name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Christmas has come to be known as a season of what? Planning, shopping, wrapping, sending, and giving gifts. 
And, you know, as much as we love to give them and receive them, and, you know, uh, part of the thing for me, you know, my, my birthday happens to be a December birthday, and some of the bittersweet of that is that sometimes there would be a temptation to try to commingle and combine those things. Well, I'd like to keep them separated. <laughs> but we're so thankful for the gifts that we have opportunity to give, to receive. Also, Lord, most importantly, did you know the greatest gift of all time is the gift of that baby who was born in Bethlehem's manger so many years ago. Amen? Amen. And what the significance of that is, the nativity story, the incarnation of the Son of God, all of these are profoundly deep and um, in, in their scope, universal, and uh, takes in everything. There's nothing that it doesn't take in. It's so great and so grand and so wonderful and so inspiring. So this morning, I'd like to share as we go through, intermingled with some musical thought, that there are in the Bible, this particular passage we want to look at this morning, the Bible speaks about seven significant gifts that God wishes to give to his children. Seven gifts from God. And uh, you can take notes from this because it's going to be right in your Bible and you'll see those seven as we look at them this morning. You know, so no matter what it is or is not under that Christmas tree or gifts that you have given or received from those we love, God offers you and to me gifts. Get this. Gifts that are more lasting. Gifts that are more sustaining. Gifts that are more fulfilling. Gifts that are greater than any gift that we could ever imagine for ourselves. The gift, the centerpiece of all those prophecies relating to the advent, relating to the advent written almost 600 years before Jesus was born. How long did I say before Christ? 600 years. I mean, just think about that. It's mind boggling when you think about it. 600 years before the nativity scene ever came onto the scene of human uh, being in, in human history. 600 years before, there was, writing under the divine inspiration of God, this prophet in the Bible, the prophet in the Old Testament, the major prophet, his name was Isaiah. And theologians call him the gospel prophet. You know why he's called the gospel prophet? Because he speaks about the gospel. <laughs> in significant ways. You know, how many books in the Bible do you have? In your Bible, how many books do you have? 66. How many chapters in the book of Isaiah? 66. And did you know that if you would take apart the book of Isaiah, the 39 first chapters of Isaiah follow, in essence, the Old Testament 39 books, and the last 27 follow the 27 last books of the Bible, which is the New Testament. So it's so powerful as you understand that and realize that. Now, when you look at the, at, the, uh, at the first four books of the New Testament, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find out there that they also are telling a story. They're telling the story of the life of Christ. So if you're looking at the life of Christ, when would you expect to find his birth? At the end or the middle or the beginning? The beginning. So when you look at the gospel prophet Isaiah, you'll also find the beginnings of Jesus that are foretold there in powerful and graphic ways in this text we want to take a look at this morning. It's found in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, and you have, may have your Bible open because you may want to underline these phrases there. But bear in mind, this is a powerful, most significant centerpiece verse that deals with this whole nativity story. Now read it with me, will you? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Say that again, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Wow, there's amazing things there. Did you know that George Frederick Handel, have you heard of his name? George Frederick Handel. 
included in one of his compositions. And the one that we all know and love is called the, what is that called? The Messiah. And the Messiah was an oratorio. What is an oratorio? An oratorio, an oratorio was composed. It was made up of choirs and orchestra, all the instruments, all the singing voices, as well as parts where solos, soloists would also perform. An oratorio. So guess, guess what? George Frederick Handel included in one of his compositions, The Messiah, Yes, get this, a 265 page oratorio. Is that large or what? 265 pages. And what is more significant is this, that George Hendrick Fred Frederick Handel wrote this uh, Messiah oratorio in just 24 days. 24 days. A score of music that included choirs and orchestra and solos. And he completed the hallelujah part of this um, Oratorio. The oratorio basically had three major parts. And of those three major parts, within them are 53 separate movements. And when he completed the last movement, the Hallelujah movement, which is, takes into, the, into account those powerful passages in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and Revelation 19, verse 16, George Frederick Handel, is reportedly told his servant these words. I did think, I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself seated on his throne with his company of angels. Isn't that amazing? As he was putting together that great work, he thought he saw all heaven. Can you imagine as he was putting that together and those tunes, the melodies, the words coming into his mind, you know, that great God himself seated on the throne with his company of angels. Isn't that awesome? A writer, a composer of these great uh, themes that is, where as you read the history, tears would come down his face as he was writing these sublime words and these thoughts, how to grasp them, how to understand them, the implication for us. Consider the rich truth in this one short verse. There was no ordinary child, but one whose coming had been long awaited. And as we looked at this text this morning, there are three of the seven phrases of the verse. Hint at who he really is. Think about it. The first phrase. What was that first phrase? For unto us a child is born. A description of him as the son of man. This is a statement about his humanity. He began like any other human. He began as infinite as an infant in Bethlehem's manger. Isaiah doesn't say any more here, but we do know from the New Testament that throughout his life, Jesus experienced every temptation that is common to humanity. Think about that. Yet he never sinned. Jesus came, became flesh and blood here on this earth. He began his life like any other human, but never sinned. And we find this in the book of Hebrews. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Get this. But he was what? In all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is our infant who came. And it speaks of his sympathy. He bears all of humanity's sin and guilt. And he comes to this world and he feels everything that you and I feel. He has hurts like all of us have hurts. He weeped. He wept like we weep. And even at his death, he felt the great weight of the sin upon his shoulders. The sin of the whole world upon him. So this little baby came unto us. A child is born, which helps us to understand 
his humanity. He relates to us. He sympathizes with us. We can never say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. We can never say that, my friends, because he went through it for us. He understands us. It's amazing to think about that, the great condescension of God himself to become human flesh. And yet this second phrase is just as significant. Unto us a son is given. A description of him as the son of God. He was the son of man, humanly speaking, and yet he is the son of God. And notice it doesn't say in this verse that he is born. It doesn't say he is born. It says he is what? Given. Significant. It speaks of his salvation that comes to us. The terminology of the Savior's pre-existence as a deity, as God. We tend to focus our, inf our attention during this time of the year. The world focuses attention on the infancy of Christ. But the greater truth of this holiday, actually holy day, where it's got off course, understand. More astonishing than a baby born in Bethlehem's manger is the truth that this promised Messiah, this promised child, is the omnipotent creator of the heavens and the earth. Again, we know the full truth of what Isaiah only suggests, that he existed before his birth. What did I say? He existed before his birth. Already God, the second person of the Trinity. More accurately, to describe it not as the Trinity, but the biblical word we could say would be the Godhead. The Godhead was given to be our Savior. The Bible who says, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And John, who would also write, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And the word, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, Son of grace and truth. He came as the Son of God, God in a human body. God came, monogenes. Which don't think of it only begotten in time. No, only begotten in terms of the unique one. The unique, only one of a kind is what this word only begotten means. The promise of the ages, the pre-existent one, the desire of all ages, as the minor prophet Habakkuk said, the desire of all the ages, who that book, that wonderful book in the Library of Congress would be written after, the desire of all ages would come. The Holy One of Israel, the light that would shine in the darkness, the only hope for our lost world. And so Isaiah foretold just a couple of chapters before that Jesus would be born to a virgin, a woman who would never be intimate with any man. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name, what? You will call his name Emmanuel. Which means, God with us. Let's listen this morning to the words of this song that try to again grip our minds to the meaning of his name and what it means to us today. Emmanuel, God with us.
Praise the Lord. He would come. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Unto us a son is born. Unto us a son is given. Third phrase, and the government would be upon his shoulders. To the Jewish nation, Isaiah's prophecy was news of a coming king. A child would be born, Isaiah said. He would shoulder the government. To the unsuspecting world, the prophecy promised a savior incarnate whose coming would dramatically alter and forever change human history, as described in James Allen Francis' One Solitary Life. He writes these words. He is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever 
built, whoever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Wow. Isn't that amazing words? In that day, the government of the whole world would rest upon his shoulders. His reign was a different kind of kingdom because he said many times when he was here on this earth, my kingdom is not of this world. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, what? King of kings and Lord of lords. Aren't you glad that as the world is getting more and more complex by the day, there is someone who knows the way forward. Aren't you glad for that today? Who looks beyond the first advent to his time steal future when Christ will come and he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And then Isaiah points to the unique features that make the Messiah's kingdom so different from any other. Exerbed. The extraordinary names given to this extraordinary son. He is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. Remarkable titles, aren't they? For an infant to be given to. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. The fourth gift. Speaking about his wisdom. Speaking about his sagacity, talk about a wise sage. The King James Version says, wonderful, comma. But I think if you would look closely, they seem to go better together and appear in that way in most modern translations. Wonderful counselor. When the, Jesus became flesh, he demonstrated his wisdom as a counselor. Study the New Testament descriptions of Jesus. Encounters with people who came to him for counsel and in a marvelous way, how he interacted with them. He always seemed to know what to say, this Jesus. And I might add, before he said anything, he always did what? Listened. And we would be, do so well to learn that lesson. Before we speak, we should first listen to be wise counselors. Jesus was the one who listened. And as a result, it was said of him in John 7, no man ever spoke like this man before. It is Jesus whom we must turn to, to make sense out of life's confusion. The psalmist said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Unfortunately, many people turn everywhere else for counsel these days, don't they? They go to the palm readers. They go to the psychics. They go to the astrologers. They go everywhere for human counsel except where they should go. There are Christian counselors, and they're the ones who give the most human help. Wouldn't you like to have a counselor who knows everything? Wonderful counselor. The only counselor knows the answer to all of life's confusion. He knows all about you. He is the only one who can give wise counsel if we will but hear and listen to him. Not only are these words wonderful about him, that he himself is a wonder, isn't he? As the song says, Jesus, what a wonder you are. You are so gentle, so pure, and so kind. You shine like the morning star. Jesus, what a wonder you are. He is also, however, the mighty God. The mighty God, notice, nothing is too difficult for the creator God, the sustainer of everything. His kingdom speaks of his sovereignty. The king is the mighty God. He is the powerful one who brought order out of chaos, who spoke and it was done, who commanded and it stood fast. Jesus, that king, Jesus, the one who loves us, who steps into the life of chaos, into our lives of chaos. And he also displays his divine power to bring order out of chaos. He's the only one that can give wise counsel because he is the only one who contains almighty power because he is almighty God. That's why the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's why the Bible says over and over again, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He is the one that can energize. He's the only one that can give power to our lives. 
Human counsel can only go so far. It stops stores. It falls short of the power, the power of God, for he enables us and is the only one that can enable us to do what is right. He's the only one who forgives sin and defeated Satan. He's the only one who can liberate people from the power of evil and can redeem them and answer their prayers and restore their broken hearts and reign over a rebuilt life. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Of the sixth truth about Jesus in this passage, this is the one non-Christians despise the most. Get me this morning. Because you see, the world is willing to acknowledge the baby Jesus in Bethlehem's range, manger. The world is willing to acknowledge that kind of a God. But this one that non-Christians despise most, the world does not see him in this way. They want to see him as Jesus. They want to sing away in the manger. They want to look at the helpless, cuddly, and vulnerable. Christmas is okay if that's as far as it goes. For it poses no threat to one's sin and pride and personal autonomy. Speak and sing if you must. But of swaddling clothes, the tiny tender infant. But then to declare that this babe is also in a manger, is also the mighty God, the holy and the infinite, the sovereign one of all. They want nothing to do with that kind of seasonal message. You understand? Jesus in a manger is one thing, but Jesus on a throne is something altogether different. Oh, no. And so we remember this morning that he is almighty God. That's why the angels came that day and they sang that song. Hark the herald. Angels, the angels came. They gave that message. And we remember that message this morning. Glory to a newborn king.
Thank you to my dear Ashley, whose dad gets to have her accompany him every once in a while. Thank you, Ash. He is also known as, when we come to the conclusion of our message today, the everlasting Father. The Bible says in Isaiah 46, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and the things from ancient times, things that are not yet done. I am God and there is no other. And Revelation picks up on this as well. I am the Alpha and the Omega, which is the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. That is from the very start. He knows everything will turn out. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. He knows how the story is going to end. And so should we, my dear friends. What a comfort to know that he is our everlasting father and that he sees everything and guarantees that all things work together for good to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. You see, in him there is no complexity, for he is the father of eternity. You see, don't get all worried about this. This is not speaking in the Trinitarian sense that they're, you know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, he's the father of eternity. The Son is also known in the sense because he is the father of the eternity, amen? And he has sensitivity. The Father is used here, depicting the relationship, not within the Godhead so much as understanding a brief, brief description, an analogy, pointing to Christ's character. For you see, what does a father do? A father sympathizes. A father understands. A father that's invoked by the picture of that word suggests that he has in mind a tenderness and sympathy of a compassionate and affectionate father time and eternity. He is the everlasting Father. Not so much eternal, just looking into the future, into the eternity of the future, but everlasting from time eternal to time eternal. Amen? That is the kind of God that you and I serve today. And finally, He is the Prince of Peace. Notice that each of these descriptions are not with an idea indefinite article such as a but the not a prince of peace not a son of god but the son of god the prince of peace finally in the messiah's kingdom there is no more conflicts aren't you glad for that my friends no more conflicts <laughs> because he is the prince of peace he offers peace to all who are recipients of his grace you and me today therefore we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the source of all serenity, for he himself is our peace. We hear so often at Christ, Christmas, the beginning of this earthly life, as heralded by angels who announce glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward all men. But the Bible says, there never has been peace on this earth in the sense we think of it. For there have been wars and rumors of wars, all kinds of things. But unto us a child is born, unto a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. The proclamation that Jesus made one day is going to take place when he's gonna all wars and rumors of wars will cease. A two-pronged proclamation first delivered before the arrival of the tiny infant in Bethlehem's manger. But more important, it is a proclamation that God is coming, that God's peace is available to every one of us. Seven gifts from Christ this Christmas. Seven gifts from God. We can take them to the bank, the eternal bank, the... It, the, the one who owns the universe, the one who's the cattle on a thousand hills are his, the one who spoke and it was and commanded and it stood fast. That same God wants to take our lives, our lives of chaos, our lives of disorder, our lives of sin, and God wants to transform us by his almighty power and by his eternal grace. 
So why don't you take these one, these seven gifts with you this Christmas season? What are they? Say them with me. A child is born. He is sympathetic savior. A son is given. He's a saving savior. Are you say amen to that? Thirdly, the government is on his shoulder. He is the supreme savior. Fourthly, he's the wonderful counselor. He is the wise sage. He is the mighty God. He's the sovereign one. He is the everlasting father. He is the sure and serene one, the prince of peace. The one we've come to worship today. The one who gives us his eternal peace. My friends, let there be peace on earth. Let there be peace on earth. And where do you think God wants it to begin? Let it begin with me. My peace I give unto you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be, what? Afraid. Aren't you glad for these seven gifts during this holiday season? May we incorporate them into our lives as we think of his eternal peace. Harmony. Let 
Be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth. Father in heaven, I pray that during this season, we would always remember you, Lord. Remember you not only as a baby in Bethlehem, remember you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember you as the supreme God of the universe. And when we are weak, help us to remember your eternal might. When we are frazzled and confused, help us to remember your great peace the peace that passes all human understanding. So may the God of peace be with us during this Sabbath day, during these days, and bring us back together again, Lord, to worship you. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Merry Christmas.